Our next panel is on cultural past and public life, and it will be moderated by Professor Dipesh Chakravarti. Professor Chakravarti, or Dipesh Da as we call him, is a Lawrence A. Kinton Distinguished Service Professor of History, South Asian Languages and Civilization at the college and the faculty director of the center in Delhi, where he advises on the programming initiatives and building partnerships at the center in India. His own research focuses on indigenous, indigenous and minority histories, history in public life, decolonization, environmental history, and implications of climate change for human history. He is also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, recipient of the Toynbee Prize, and most recently, the Tagore Memorial Prize, awarded by the government of West Bengal. Over to you, Dipeshda. Welcome to you, everybody, uh, to this second panel. And uh, I have a wonderful uh, collection of speakers here. Uh, as you heard, I'm Dipesh Chakravarti, so I teach in the history department and in the Department of South Asian Languages and Civilizations. Um, and uh, by my side, there's Sudha Gopalakrishnan, who is one of the founders of um, Sahapedia. I hope it's one thing to be resonant and evoke echoes, and but you know, just. <laughs> <laughs> OK, good. Um, um, and Sudha actually is the former founding director of the National Mission for Manuscripts under the Ministry of Culture, Government of India. Um, then we have, of course, our own Gary Tubb, my close uh, and dear colleague uh, in the Department of South Asian Languages and Civilization. Gary is a very well-known Sanskritist and Indologist. Um, and then next to Gary, we have uh, Professor Tapati Gohathakurta. Tapati is a renowned uh, historian of art. She began as a historian of art, uh, then wrote a very fascinating book uh, on museums uh, and objects, uh, and eventually has been uh, involved in an ongoing project. But there's been a book out of that project, too, on um, the cultural festival of Durga Puja this worshipping of Goddess Durga. That is one of the major, major festivals in the country, and a very major festival in, the, uh, in my hometown, which is also our hometown of Calcutta. Um, and then next to Tapati, we of course have uh, David Levin, who is um, Vice Provost for the Arts, but also a Professor in German Studies, a Specialist in Opera, and the Chair of our Theatre and Performance Studies program, uh, which has been expanding to take uh, a lot of interest in, in, in the performance traditions of this country. So in, a, in effect, this panel represents the humanistic uh, endeavors at the University of Chicago. Chicago um, has a wonderful tradition of a humanities, uh, as a humanities institution, apart from being other things. And I still remember when I joined the University of Chicago uh, in 1995, Marshall Thalens, who is a very well-known anthropologist who had just retired, said to me with a lot of pride, he said, Dipesh, you always remember that in Chicago, we don't do anything useful or fashionable. Now, that's only half true, as you see. Chicago does a lot of useful stuff. But Chicago does a lot of uh, stuff that is of not of any obvious immediate use. In fact, one of the texts that we used to teach our undergraduates, and I think we still teach it, is uh, Plato's Apology. And we always used to ask our undergraduates to write an essay on, this, on the statement that an unexamined life is not worth living. Uh, and clearly, that's not a policy statement. That's a profoundly philosophical statement and still of value, I think, uh, as we look on the world, as we look at the situation. In fact, climate change was mentioned this morning uh, by our provost. Nothing about climate can be done without actually profoundly questioning the values we have, things we value. Should we continue to value the things we value? Should we continue to, be, to remain attached to things uh, that may not, in the end, be good for us? So those, those are the questions that we raise in the humanities. And the particular um, question the, of a humanities question and a softer social science question that we will be dealing with on this panel is the question of cultural past. You know, 
pasts matter in all societies in different ways. But this country, India, South Asia, I would think, is a part of the world which you simply don't understand if you don't understand why people get so obsessed about things that happened 300 years ago, things that happened in the 16th century. And these are issues that produce change electoral results in this country. These are issues over which heads get broken. These are issues over which uh, court cases are lodged. These are issues over which street names are changed. When Indian, na I mean, if you think about Indian nationalist movement, Indian nationalist movement would have been impossible in the 20th century without debating two 17th century kings, Shivaji and Aurangzeb. And so it's a fascinating question why our passions get caught up with questions about the past. And the obvious uh, point or of illustration is, of course, the case of uh, the Babri Masjid in Ayodhya, which, as you know, has been a disputed site, um, with a lot of people claiming that it used to be a temple to uh, Lord Ram. Uh, but the fascinating thing about that dispute with the past is that it could not have been settled by archaeologists and what their findings and opinions were. I mean, uh, for me, this was a very interesting contrast. I mean, uh, I spent a lot of time from my PhD years in Australia. And when I was in Australia, the whole, there was a, the, a political question of the past was, for how long had the Aboriginal people been in Australia? Because depending on the number, their political claims about land rights became stronger, right? So if you said 30,000 years, <coughs> That had one implication, if you said 60. But that number, whether Aust Aboriginals had actually existed in Australia for 30,000 years or 60,000 years, was always decided by archaeologists. Nobody brought a court case about it. Nobody assumed that the court had the capacity to adjudicate a matter that properly belonged to archaeologists. Whereas here, this is a court case, as you know, in front of the Supreme Court. And eventually, the court will have to decide uh, what can be said about this 16th century uh, mosque uh, that was demolished a few years ago. And that actually is central to the politics of the country. So as an observer, I, uh, what I'm saying is I was fascinated by the difference in the location and the status of intellectual disciplines. Right? The kind of prestige that an archaeologist could carry in Australian society is almost impossible for an Indian archaeologist to have. And one of the things we study in Chicago is precisely not just the history of the disciplines, but the actual history of discipline in different societies, and why <coughs> certain disciplines matter in certain societies, and why certain disciplines don't matter. So for instance, here, the other example I can give, there are groups of marginalized people, oppressed people, people who sometimes uh, are referred to as Dalit people in India. One of the one of the very impressive studies about Dalit people has been done by an Indian scholar called Badri Narayan. And Badri Narayan's book actually demonstrates that Dalits in UP have erected statues to historical figures whose existence historians can't confirm. Jhalkari Bai, her role in the 1857 rebellion. Raja Suheldev. And it's a fascinating question, when you erect a statue, a likeness of somebody you've never seen. How do you imagine what they, what they look like? So people have actually done fascinating work you know, in trying to figure out how these Dalits actually came to imagine in building a statue what Suhail Dev might have looked like, what Jhalkari Bai might have looked like. So the point is that this is why this panel is very important. This is a society that constantly fights over its past. The past is one of the most politicized and contested aspects of public life in India. This is why the panel, um, the idea was that uh, each of the panelists would begin by saying a little bit about their own work and how they come to these problems. And I'm hoping that out of that, we will be able to weave a meaningful conversation and hopefully leave a little bit of time for interaction with all of you. Thank you. So, Sudha.
Thank you so much. You put the whole perspective of the past and the present in a very wide focus. So when I got this, uh, this invitation, I was actually confused. Where do I begin? How do I, what do I negotiate in this, in this meeting about the past? And where do, does one locate? Like I said, there are many, many perspectives that can come into this picture. Then I thought that the, perhaps one of the best ways is to see how I have, in my personal and professional life, come across the past. And maybe that's one way to begin. So in that w sense, I'd like to introduce myself as a, basically a researcher and with a special focus on exploring the, exploring the um, texts and traditions, performative traditions of South India with special, some special focus on Kerala. The Mani Pravalam literature, the Sanskrit Malayalam uh, combined called Mani Pravalam literature is something that I have been pursuing for a long time. And also Kodiyattam, Kathakali and Teyam, these forms from Kerala has been of some interest to me. And in 2003, I start, I got the opportunity to, to see this vast treasure of knowledge of written material, written heritage, contained in the manuscript Wealth of India. Uh, through a mission that the government of India, through the Ministry of Culture, invited me to join for about five years. A mission was always to last for five years at that time. But now I believe it has gone on after that. So I was there from 2003 to 2008. And that was a great opportunity to understand what we have in terms of written knowledge, in terms of uh, the different scripts, the dialects, the languages, the regions that we have, manuscripts, the scripts, and not to speak of the immense knowledge systems that we say that we possess in terms of what we say that we are a cultural superpower. I mean, we, those are hype statements and all that. But then how much thought that people have invested in the past on such disciplines like right from philosophy to music to aesthetic traditions to uh, to any any subject, even uh, treatment of elephants, for example, and also how to do personal makeup, facial makeup, any um, you, any subject in in reckoning, we have done a lot of work. And these are all this written knowledges are all inscribed in manuscripts, with their diversity in terms of scripts, in terms of languages, in terms of regions that they belong to, right from Assam to. Kanyakumari to Ladakh to Gujarat to this spread all over India. So this mission's first mandate was to survey for the first time perhaps in one sense, survey this wealth through a kind of cultural mapping. So we did this for five years at the time that I was there. I'm sure it is continuing right now. And we estimated that there's about five million manuscripts, which is perhaps now an understatement. Maybe there are more. The thing is that they are, these are distributed among libraries, archives, museums across the country, but also in private collections. I think every ancestral family, going back to 100, 150 years, have manuscripts in their in their possession. Also sacred sites such as temples, mathas. It, it was actually very mind-boggling to reckon with that diversity and the numbers. So we, uh, at the manuscript mission, we started affiliating with about 400 institutions all over the country, right from, like I said, right from Leh, Ladakh to Kashmir to Rajasthan to, to everywhere, right up to Kerala to Karnataka. So through these, we did a massive survey of manuscripts uh, from door to door survey, perhaps in 2003 and four. Maybe this was one of the biggest cultural mapping that may have happened at that point of time. And we also put them into an electronic database in which people were supposed to fill the forms, the metadata forms and then integrate it into the main server, which is at Delhi. So that was a w good thing, and the metadata still, I think, exists there for everybody to see. The other thing, the other, other challenges of the mission was to do digitization, massive digitization of actual text, then do some kind of conservation of very endangered manuscripts, teaching scripts. These are all different languages and scripts, so one had to also learn the scripts. So all these happened side by side simultaneously. But what I want to say here is not about that. It's about the fact that how it was accessible to the people at large. I mean, if it is not, there's so much of knowledge, but if it is, doesn't go to the people, then I felt at that point that it is beating the very purpose of why it started. While the database itself was open for people, for example, if you wanted to know something about Git Govinda, you can always see from the database that it exists in Kerala, it exists in uh, Kashmir, it exists in uh, Gujarat. So that information was available. But whatever we had digitized at that time, and I'm talking about 2000, early 2000s, when perhaps the, all the protocols were not in place for digitization, um, we did make some kind of guidelines and standards. But 
when somebody, a scholar, would come to ask, for example, I have many, many sad stories here. One, when I specifically remember is one grammarian from, from the West, one of the Western universities came and asked me about 12 folios of Katantra Vritti Rahasya, a text, very specific text that would aid his study. But our, according, though I had the, we had the digitized text, we had to uh, ask the person who, the custodian of the manuscript to ask whether they would part with it or not. And in that case and in many, many cases, usually though we had the digitized text with us, they would not give us permission to, to give it to the, the seeker of that knowledge. So this made me thinking how, how, how could we even, what is the point in doing this digitization at all? In fact, many, many government institutions have the same problem. Now digitization is, has become much more popular. People do that a lot. Every institution wants to digitize. But there are no common standards. There's no metadata standard, no common guidelines. So, and also perhaps there's no information also. So what I'm putting onto this panel is information to information in one sense. How does, how do we get access to material that is available in India to people, uh, to people who want to use that. So this is a very key challenge in my perception. And I'm sure this is the case with anyone who wants to consult manuscripts or even any other data. This is why I think into, uh, I had left the mission in 2008. And then I sta we started collaboratively something called Sahapedia. Saha being the Sanskrit <coughs> word to be together with, to do collaboratively. So, so this is very much a collaborative open project, open for everyone to use, to contribute, to uh, adapt if needed, uh, 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 again with permissions of course from the owner. So this is one thing that we started doing at, and it is now picked up some, picked on quite a bit, though we call it an end, is my time up? Um, yeah, finish up perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm. Yeah, so the, the, I don't want to talk too much about Sahapedia again. I well, mean I'll, have, I'll have questions to ask you about Sahapedia <laughs> anyway. So yeah. Yeah. But okay. my, my submission here is to think about archives in the country, the state of archives in the country generally, and see how the data that is available with people, most of which is almost perished and, it, and the, in the stage of you know vanishing, how to put that together as a public resource for people to use and how to make people understand the need to preserve their <coughs> records of any kind and be it a kind of, it can be a manuscript, can audio, video, many people are willing to share. But there's no common pool, people are confused where does one give, how does, how do we go about it. So this is one question rather than an answer that I am just putting before you and we could take this further. Thank sure. you so much. Um, Gary, so what we'll have, we'll have, just have statements from each one of you and then I'll raise some questions and, uh, yeah. So Gary. Okay. Uh, Thanks. My own connection with uh, uh, the cultural past has been uh, through two channels, really. Um, one of them uh, was my role as uh, faculty director here at the uh, UChicago Center during the first several years after it opened, a task that was made much easier by the work that had already been done by Dupesh as the, as the preliminary uh, faculty director of the center reaching back even to the time before construction started on the center. Uh, so I'm grateful for that. And it's very nice to be back in the center, even on a very short uh, trip like this, and to see that it's still uh, moving along very well. Thanks also to the work that Mark did as an interim director. Uh, I, I also wanted to say that whether I'm here or in Chicago, I'm always extremely proud of our executive <coughs> director here, Aditi Modi, and all of the work that's done by the uh, uh, diligent and genial uh, people on her staff. They're the ones who really make it possible on the ground uh, for the center to continue to be successful in all of its activities. And they do this through their labors day after day uh, uh, throughout the entire year even in the face of uh, uh, frequent sources of exasperation, such as Chicago faculty members who just come in and out. But they're here every day, and uh, I'm very grateful for that as well. One of the uh, challenges of uh, those years as a faculty director here was that although I tried to be as attentive as I could to the mission of the center to be useful to all areas of academic uh, activity in the university. I also couldn't help 
feeling a special interest in the peculiar challenges and the peculiar potential of academic work in the humanities and in the humanistic social sciences, and much of it involving an attention to, um, to the past. And this was natural for me because the second channel of my connection to the past was through my own academic specialization, which is as a Sanskritist, uh, working on Sanskrit language and literature um, and philosophy uh, in ways in which uh, uh, attention to the past has really been central. I, f I, start I first started studying Sanskrit almost exactly, slightly more than half a century ago, and throughout that entire time, the uh, abiding interest of Sanskrit studies to me has been the access that it gives us to an especially uh, long and rich record of human intellectual and cultural activity. Of course, it's a record which uh, is not complete. Dipesh has hinted at the fact that many voices are missing from the Sanskrit record, but the record that we do have in itself is one uh, in which uh, we have a very large corpus of literature uh, recorded through the centuries in what is recognizably the same grammar, uh, but reaching back over more than 3,000 years. And during that time, there's also a great amount of uh, interaction between systems of knowledge. And Dupesh also mentioned the importance of studying uh, particular disciplines in there. So I'll just uh, finish up by saying uh, first that uh, <coughs> within Sanskrit studies, I've been especially interested in uh, the history of organized systems of knowledge, Shastra, and more particularly in the Shastras that have focused on uh, things that have don't have quite the same history outside of India, that is the interior life of humans, the Shastras that focus on, on language, on literature, on aesthetics, and also on philosophical questions involving consciousness and knowledge and the interconnections between these. And one thing I hope we'll have time to talk about is how much overlap uh, there has turned out to be between the things that interest me and the things that Sudha has been doing, especially now with Sahapedia, and quite obviously with the manuscripts, and uh, things such as the Kudiyatam tradition of uh, drama, which I first learned about through her own academic writings on this, and which played an important role in some of the activities that I tried to foster here at the center. I hope we can get back to sure. that. But I'll stop at that. Stop at that. It's on. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, my thanks to the University of Chicago Center for inviting me to be on this panel, especially so because I've actually never stepped into the University of Chicago ever, uh, but nonetheless I've been part of its activities in the Delhi Center, so it's an honor to be part of this panel. Uh, let me briefly just think a bit about how my work as a historian, and that is my main discipline. I I'm a historian of modern India or the modern subcontinent. So the pasts I study are not deep and ancient pasts, unlike those that Sudha and Gary have been looking at. Uh, my work has largely been related to 19th and 20th century pasts, uh, and the ways in which the more ancient past notions of antiquity are invoked within modern disciplinary and institutional contexts. One of my prime concerns in the different work I've done over time, going back to the 80s into the present, has been to consider the way to study the past. So the past, in a way, is my profession, but to continuously consider the location of the past in the present. So cultural pasts and their public locations cultural past and their locations in the political present has been an ongoing concern of, of my work. And so the past has always been seen not just as something we recover, we study, we reinterpret, but as something that is also continuously being contested and challenged within public spheres. 
So this has been an ongoing area of interest. So very briefly to place that trajectory of interest, when I first worked several years ago on the history of art and nationalism in late 19th and early 20th century Bengal, uh, one of the things that continuously one contended with was what was this category of the Indian? What constituted Indian art and aesthetics? What is the past of an Indian artistic past that was being mobilized for modern practice? And there were huge debates around the legitimacy of what was being reconstructed as a usable Indian past for modern artists. So partly my concern was to look at the texture of all these debates and uh, many fissures that continuously attended the reconstruction of the past. My later work looked much more at institutional sites and locations. I was looking at the fields of archaeology and art history in particular, disciplines to which I never belonged, but which I feel as a modern historian, one needed to understand the new disciplinary locations from which the ancient Indian past was being recovered, the kind of object assemblages, the material remnants that were being mobilized. So that work also opened up to the series of debates between British and Indian writers, but equally between Indian writers on ways in which that past was to be interpreted and written about. And here, one could think about simple things like religious denominations, which were very, very broad denominations which were continuously being placed within the field. So I looked at many of these continuous challenges in this book called Monuments, Objects, and Histories. And I'll just take up one specific instance since which something that uh, Dipesh Da had already brought up. One of the last essays in this book, Monuments, Objects, Histories, but which in many ways was for me the founding essay for the book, was actually looking at the debate on the site of Ayodhya and on the Ram Janmabhumi movement of the 1990s. The book was finally written in 2004. And one of the things that drove me to that essay and another essay which was looking at M.F. Hussain and the contestations over his rights to paint Hindu divinities in various states of dress and undress. I was looking at the way the discipline of art history and archaeology, which were solidly founded disciplines with colonial and nationalist past, had this extremely uneasy location in the public domain. It is really their uneasiness, their inadequate location in the public domain that made it impossible to provide as you were saying, a corrected domain of public knowledge that could be mobilized. So for the Babri Masjid, I have considered the fragility of the very category of the monument that had been raised in colonial and nationalist India. And in fact, it was the refusal to grant the masjid the protection of an archaeological monument which sealed its fate. It remained a disputed property. It was a 16th century Mughal monument was never given the protection of an archaeological monument that ensured, that sealed its fate. And ever since the debate, the attempt to use archaeological evidence also proved the consistent and almost spectacular failure of archaeological and art historical knowledge to protect the past, to, you know, to give the immunity that worlds of art or the worlds of archaeological monuments desired. So despite such a strong disciplinary foundation for these, we realize the disconnect between the worlds this scholarship occupied and other worlds of public political knowledges with which they wish to engage. So this became a really um, important lesson. Uh, my later work has been on a very different field of contemporary history, but if I've finished my time, I'll wait for the questions to come okay, to speak to about a very different public domain <laughs> that I'm having to negotiate in the work that I've done in the 2000s. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Before I invite David to make thing, so I should actually explain why David is part of the panel. <laughs> <laughs> he, apart from a very interesting scholar, interested in it, he is clearly the outlier. He studies Germany. But you know, often what happens is you get so obsessed with your own society and its history, and it seems so unique and inevitable to you, 
that we thought it would be wonderful to have somebody look at similar questions, but in a completely different context. Uh, because the past is contested everywhere, different pasts in different ways. Uh, so, uh, so we thought it would be wonderful to have David give us the perspective of an outsider uh, to make us more aware of our own parochialism parochial interests. <laughs> um, uh, it's always uh, lovely to be on a panel with distinguished guests and uh, to be officially designated as an outsider rather than <laughs> merely <laughs> it's a privilege. experiencing it's it. It's a position of a privilege. <laughs> uh, uh, rather than merely experiencing that as right. a psychological <laughs> fact. Um, uh, I want to just echo the thanks that my colleagues have already articulated. I'll do it very quickly. Five years is a remarkably short time, and in a very short time, this center has become a very important crossroads, it seems to me, for ideas and for people. It's uh, a thrill to be here uh, and to be here with you. I wanted to congratulate Arditi and the, my colleagues who have been directors and the staff here for creating a kind of um, a, a kind of center um, uh, that I think encapsulates very much the spirit of the University of Chicago, a spirit of exchange and of rigor uh, and of openness. Um, uh, I wanted to, the charge that we were given was to speak, as you will have heard, about our personal experiences. So it's, I'll, uh, let me give you just two quick anecdotes that I think encapsulate that, that status. Um, that will give you a sense of how my work relates to the work that we're discussing here. When I was an undergraduate, I uh, did not go to the University of Chicago, um, in retrospect to my uh, misfortune, um, but instead went to a college that invited students to create their own curricula. And so I created a curriculum in what I called opera studies, which was not something that existed. It barely exists today. But my thought was that if we study works of opera, we actually are at the intersection of contemporary politics and interpretation, that the stakes of engaging with 17th century, 18th century, 19th and 20th century European uh, classical works was precisely those stakes were precisely the stakes of politics that I was interested in. So I. Uh, after I graduated, I went to the work in Germany at the Frankfurt Opera doing sort of what seemed to me to be really provocative productions of these classical works and got my first production as a young, young aspiring director um, at the Bremen Opera doing a production of Puccini's Turandot. Um, Puccini's Turandot, which premiered in the mid-1920s, a work that emerged right in the shadow of fascism and has traces of its fascist origins and of Puccini's flirtations and Franco Alfano, the librettist's flirtations with fascism, it was a work that was left unfinished. And the question of where it would have and how it would have finished was one that we, as young producers, were very much concerned with. We did this production in Bremen, and I thought it was the production that we did which reflected on the collapse of opera in the mid-1920s. This is the last great opera that's written by some historical accounts, I thought was a reflection not just on the state of opera, but also on what it means to do opera in the shadow of fascism in 1980s Germany. Um, we did this production, and, uh, and afterwards, as is the tradition in Germany, the director, conductor, designers, the production team came out on stage and took our bows and the lights are very bright uh, when you come out on stage. Um, and we took our bows, and I got hit in the chest <laughs> with a tomato. <laughs> Which, I mean, it, uh, it, it actually sounds funny, but it was, it, it was astonishing. It also hurt. I mean, uh, you know, a tomato thrown from, you know, 300 yards that hits you in the chest. And it became crystal clear to me then that this was not a trifling matter. It's why I had gone to Germany, because the, the adjudication of the cultural past uh, is very much a matter of, of burning concern, but the stakes are very high. Um, and it's clear to me that those stakes remain very high, not just in Germany, which leads me to my second anecdote. Uh, a couple of months ago, a member of the city council in Stuttgart 
in Germany, issued, he's a member of the new populist right-wing party, the AFD, the alternative for Germany, issued a, ha, you have a right as a city councilman to um, make demands as an individual city councilman. So he issued a demand because the state, uh, because the state pays for art, he demanded that all members of the ensemble of the state opera, of the ballet, and of the orchestra should be compelled to reveal their nationality. Because why in Germany would the state of Germany be employing non-Germans? Because this is German taxpayer money, and the state is creating art for the people. So surely, these artistic institutions should not be informed by, or even indeed in the control of foreign nationals. Mm. The question of the, of the political present of public life and the cultural past that is entrusted to cultural organizations uh, was sort of made physically clear to me on that day in the early 1980s. That's not how I then decided to become an academic, although I have not been pelted with tomatoes since I arrived at the University of Chicago. I'm happy to say. But the, but the sense that the stakes are in fact that high, that tinkering with cultural, with, with cultural objects, or not just tinkering with them, but intervening in them, that the stakes of doing so are high, and that the interpretive value of doing so is high. This, it strikes me, is an important and an ongoing insight. It can go in many directions, not necessarily in the direction of sort of spontaneous violence or concerted political intervention. But it seems to me both of these, both of these anecdotes suggest to us that the past is not merely the past and that the status of the past continues to be, as we just heard, highly contested. So, as an outsider, my guess is that the, uh, that the anecdotes will ring familiar. They certainly ring familiar in the context of the United States. Um, but my hope would be that our discussions here at the center of how we constellate the political life, I'm sorry, the, the matter of cultural pasts with public life remain a compelling and indeed an important matter indeed. Thank you, David. So listening to my colleagues here, I'm, I've got, um, I'm thinking of this as a way of proceeding, uh, if you all agree. <coughs> I've got four or five questions for all of you. And they kind of um, come out of what you've said and what we've, what we've discussed. Um, so first of all, there is a kind of normative thread of expectation. Uh, running through our work when we speak as academics, which is, for instance, the whole question of should we have as much as possible an accurate representation of the past? So the question of authenticity, of question of veracity, is always something that bothers us or that concerns us. Whereas India is a place where, you know, this morning Michael was talking about translation of ideas into practice, but what also happens in our history is ideas get translated into other ideas. Mm -hmm. So an English word like public gets translated into many indigenous ways of understanding it. And in Hindi expressions, you might say, do char public idea, which is impossible to say in English, uh, <laughs> meaning like literally means three or four public came. But meaning probably three or four members of the public came. But that's a particular use, use of the word public. Um, so the word public itself, kind of, or the word, or what Sudha was saying, accuracy was when Gary interprets his texts. So this question of being faithful to the past, which is something we're all trained to do, and the question of relating our that concern to what you see in the public world, which is things are getting translated, things are getting uh, appropriated, not always with that kind of our notion of fidelity to the original meaning of the word, and that itself raises interesting questions about how we think normatively about these problems and how we relate our normative thinking to what actually goes on, on uh, as practice. 
And with that in mind, is that so I'll raise a few questions. One is, Sudha, you talked about uh, in Sahapedia as well as uh, the, the manuscript mission, this whole question of people having access to their own pasts and through their texts, through uh, different versions of the texts. So there is this, and, it's, and clearly access is a question of democracy. Uh, it's one of the fundamental questions of democracy. So, but that question of access is mediated by the question that you've all raised in different ways, that the past is actually contested. I mean, uh, even the performance of Kudiyattam, uh, uh, Gary was telling us yesterday that uh, one of our colleagues um, who was a specialist in Malayalam language said, oh, I wouldn't have ever have Kudiyattam uh, performed around me. And Gary said, why? He said, it's so Brahminical. Right? So clearly, there is the Kudiyattam tradition, and there is a contestation of that tradition. Somebody saying, oh, you should be doing something else. Uh, Tapati talked about the contested nature of the past. And as you said, David, it's, it's always contested. And the interesting thing is, of course, as academics, we teach our students not to become partisans, mm -hmm. but to actually become process observers. So to see how they're contested. Do the modes of contest contestation vary from one place to another? What do they say about democracy, about uh, 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 all those things? The third question is, so contestation, so access, our notion of uh, authenticity versus what actually happens. Con the question of contestation that you raised. The third question you have raised in different ways, and Tapati's work that she didn't talk about, we'll bring this more into view, is the past as, as performed. Uh, now, the past is performed and staged in a particular way within a museum. But when you have a digital museum, or you create a virtual museum, that raises other questions of uh, democracy. I mean, I was part of the whole uh, forum in, in Berlin, looking at their collection of uh, oriental art. And this question arose, which technologically is feasible, but I don't think we've, we've done it, whether people sitting in their own countries could actually visit these Berlin collections and negotiate them, go through separate rooms, and have an experience of visiting those museums virtually. And, and so on the one hand, it's kind of held up the vista of really democratizing these collections, right? People in different ways, because there's a whole contested history of these collections, as such, as you know. Um, but at the same time, the very question of digitization raises the question of uh, the fourth question, which is goes back to the first question of accuracy, that when you create these spaces, and there's so much power that digitization gives you, it itself becomes a problem of, it can become a problem of authenticity. I mean, fake news is just one thing. But fake information, uh, how do you guard against it? Because again, on the other hand, because people having digital access to these virtual museums will also have access to certain kind of digital power, right? To, in fact, edit their own experience of doing it. And so what kind of problems does digitization bring with it uh, for, for your uh, thinking? And my last question is, in different contexts, do you have a sense that certain paths matter and certain paths don't? So in our discussion, you know, I jokingly said, Probably nobody will break anybody's head over the question of whether or not Homo sapiens really massacred the Neanderthals. I mean, it's a question of the past, but it doesn't exercise us to that level. So there's a question about what pasts really become something contentious, and which pasts don't. Is it purely contextual? Can one have a sense of, in different places, what kind of pasts are sensitive? Uh, um, this work on Durga Puja, again, <coughs> raises this question of creating new spaces as distinct from museums, creating what she calls a, an archive, cultural archive of the present. And I'd be very interested to know what is the sense in which you're using the word archive there. Uh, is that the same as uh, the formal archives you know, that the Prussian state had, for instance, which we historians deal with? So these are some of the questions I just want to raise for you to uh, respond to any one of them as provocations. And then once we have the discussion, I want to open it up for uh, a larger conversation. Yeah. So any one of you is invited to respond to any one of these uh, uh, questions if they work as provocations for you. Maybe Tapati, I could call on you because you, you, you didn't have a chance to talk about the Durga Puja project. Oh. But maybe you can. Uh, one, uh, to come, if just to briefly respond to say that there was one kind of public sphere 
that one was working with when I was looking at the domain of modern art practice, the debates on Indian tradition, the literary public sphere of periodicals within which artwork circulated in early 20th century Bengal. It was like an educated literary public sphere within which was being initiated to think about new ways of looking and thinking about art. So that was one kind of public sphere, and I felt that sphere of circulation, articulation, debate was critical to understanding the larger discursive sphere within which art and nationalism unfolded. The other was the sphere, as I was raising, that which archaeological sites, monuments, and the museum in particular as an institution. What was the desired public? What is the new initiated, educated publics that uh, these disciplines and the institutions were trying to initiate? And there was always a gap between so-called desired, what museum authorities often called appropriate and inappropriate publics, publics that insisted on touching and praying rather yes. than observing, thinking about history. So these were concerns that I had. But my work on the Durga Puja, which I worked from the 2000s, uh, took me into an entirely, firstly, it brought me into contemporary history. But I also understood how the publics of this festival sphere was both linked to, but yet categorically different. It was a mass public sphere to begin with. It is one where it is impossible to segregate. As you said, the Dothin public meant the Amadmi, <laughs> and it meant the more connoisseurial. Here was a space where there was no room for the connoisseur or the critic. And I felt that my attempt to be a connoisseur and a critic in understanding the way, and here one must give the background. I was looking at the way the Durga Puja, not as a religious, but as a cultural event, was turning the entire city into a public exhibitionary space. So it was the way in which Puja was becoming a public art event. There was a pedagogy of popular taste. You were introduced to historical monument, folk and tribal art village, to world art sites, all through the space of the festival. It's a different kind of cultural public. Also, nothing that's crooked path, but this is a cultural public that is mobile. So I was trying to understand a public sphere of touring, spectatorship, and consumption. Not a public, and a public that is as invested in walking the city, so actually traversing through time and space, actual time and space, at the same time virtual time and space, because you're moving through an imagined topography of time. And what interested me, particularly since so much of publics are now constituted by the social media, of course, we know, that this is a public that was as invested in walking and touring as with the continuous photography. And increasingly, photography is much more important. So you photograph more than you see, and then you upload and you circulate. So I was trying to understand these completely new modes of spectation that belong to the present. And what is the form of co uh, consumption that this brings us to? Where pasts are being produced, but which is a much less contestatory domain. And let me just put it, it was interesting that anything goes in this world. You could have Durga inside a remake of a Mughal palace. You could have Durga inside a golden temple, a Sikh temple. You could have Durga inside a modern public art installation. And it all is acceptable with no affront to religious sensibility. There is an attempt now to bring up that divide. But what interested me is the, the flexibility of this public sphere of cultural consumption. And what does the secular mean in such a sphere? I've been asking it because there's no easy fit of the secular within the sphere. And yet, this is a space, it's like theme park viewing. And yet, it brings together publics of all kinds. So this was one of the ways I wish to think about an entirely new kind of ways in which cultural paths and public spheres of consumption and of pedagogy of popular tastes are happening. And my challenge, you could say, as a person who was much more 
used to working with archives and libraries was how to archive something that was ephemeral and fleeting and transient. Nothing that was made in this sphere is made to last. There's no documentation that happens. In the last couple of years, the main documentations are on Facebook, on social media. Mm. And that is the sphere I've been looking at. How do I archive this present? How do I archive that is fleeting, that is transient, that is ephemeral? How, as a historian used to working with much more stable and secure archives, do we create new archives mm -hmm. for the public? Totally. Thank you. So great questions. So we have about seven minutes before we open it up for another I'm conversation. So I invite. I no, not at all. No, no, it was good. Time. It was good to hear about the project. And if I could so say, of course, yeah. First, to pick up on uh, what you had to say, Depeche, about uh, well, the example you gave of how the word public comes from English into various Indian, Indian and languages. Becomes an Indian word. I wanted to point out that this sort of influence it works in more than one direction. And to mention just one example, um, the whole development of modern linguistics in Europe and, and America would not have been possible without the discovery of the um, remarkably precise and uh, accurate uh, work of ancient Sanskrit uh, grammarians and writers on, on phonology. And this is not simply a case of <coughs> duplicating previous knowledge, because uh, this is true in, uh, uh, in modern times, not only of descriptive linguistics, but also of historical and comparative linguistics, which the Sanskrit grammarians themselves did not even acknowledge the possibility of. Sure. But it brings up questions of access that are connected with questions of, uh, of authority and of uh, adhikara, to use the sure. Sanskrit right. word. Um, and this is an important topic at present, partly because a recognition of some of the more valuable parts of the past is kind of strangled uh, whenever anyone insists on looking only for evidence in the past of, for example, the current contents of, of Western physical sciences. Um, and so that's a problem. And the question of access to knowledge, again, operates in more than one direction because uh, here we're dealing with very specialized knowledge, not just you know ancient Sanskrit text, but of modern oral performances. This is where I think of Sahapedia, both in connection with what I mentioned as the possibilities of the humanities, but also the difficulties. Mm -hmm. So I do urge anyone who hasn't already done it to go on the internet to sahapedia.org, right. and there you will see remarkable things about uh, uh, oral Hindi recitations of the Mahabharata, where there's a huge <coughs> amount of specialized knowledge that is available in a very vibrant form. And you'll see a very elegant and sophisticated um, set of modules describing these things. So that's a good moment to bring <laughs> Suda in. <laughs> and here we should say, and you should talk about this, mm -hmm. it, these are also mm -hmm. remarkable achievements that are dependent upon various kinds of support which are not always forthcoming because it's in the nature of these activities that they don't always generate internally the sort of revenue that's needed to sustain that effort. So that. Thank you for bringing up those points, very vital points. Uh, I think I'll take up both the points that you made, both with Tapti and also Gary. Uh, I think to me, past is not a monolith in that sense that we are looking at the past and which past, like rightly what you said, which past are we looking at? Whatever, I mean, uh, for example, last century, there was this critical edition of the Mahabharata by Suttankar in the mm -hmm. uh, Bhandarkar Oriental. At this point of time, I don't think anybody will dare do a kind of um, uh, critical edition of the Mahabharata because which Mahabharata, which is the, the prime text? There are texts and texts, I mean, like Gary was talking about the Pandwani. We had done a documentation of five, five versions of Pandwani, not one Pandwani that we popularly know and which gets exhibited in all kinds of festivals, but there are five kinds of Pandwani going to the roots of one person holding that knowledge. So that kind of knowledge becomes very, I mean, if it, that is not democratic, what is? The point is to get access and to, so again, the archiving, the question of archiving and that kind of thing comes. So even binaries like traditional folk, old, new, literate, all those things also, I think in one sense, 
to me disappear because we are looking at, uh, even if we are looking at the past, we are looking at it from the point of view of now. So heritage is what you create now with, with whatever knowledge we are trying to interpret from the past. This is my understanding and this is what we have worked towards. My, my good friend Carlo Ginzburg, the historian, uh, once said to me, and I'm quoting from memory, he said, your questions come out of the present, but your answers must come out of the past. Mm. And that's what often doesn't happen, but David. Um, it strikes me that, I mean, so uh, looking around the room, um, I, I say this merely as a, I think, a statement of fact. Uh, it seems to me that fully one half of the people uh, in the audience are online. Right? I mean, we're all looking at screens all Probably the time. Probably presently online, yeah. And, and I mean, I, I couldn't, I've got two screens with me up here. So um, this, is, this is merely, uh, it seems to me, uh, 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 descriptively true. So for us to be thinking, as any number of us have been suggesting about the past, um, it seems to me we should, could and should probably just as well be talking about the cultural present uh, and public life and that the mediation of the past through the digitized present and our access to it um, is a matter that is so pressing as to require you know, whole new fields of inquiry. And I think our discussion here s begins to suggest the urgency of that. Um, uh, just as a way of accounting for what we do, uh, <coughs> let alone what the stakes are of, of what we do. Just a, a, a brief uh, point about this. So since I work on opera, um, it is for the, last, uh, for the last seven years, it has been a fact that uh, opera, which used to be consumed of all quaint thoughts in an opera house, uh, is now consumed by an order of magnitude of three, um, much more frequently, statistically, online than it is in an opera house. Um, uh, and the fact, and the fact that the Metropolitan Opera now beams its performances to cinema houses, there's still a residue of publicity. Uh, to opera, crowds still gather, even if not necessarily in opera houses. But, but the fact that you know that that this form, which was initially the form of uh, princely courts, and then the development of publicity itself in uh, the early 17th century, has become a deeply and fundamentally individuated and mediated form, mediated now not by the preposterousness of human live performance, but the double preposterousness of its appearance on our screen. This is something that we need to be thinking. Um, yeah. And my so guess is it's you. something that. Sure. Before I open it up, I think Suda wants to make a very quick point. Yeah, very quick, absolutely. So uh, uh, like I mean, uh, drawing, uh, coming back to the question of archiving, archiving and archiving the past with mu the multiplicities and the diversities that we <coughs> have across <coughs> India. Uh, how, d how do we do that? I mean, what do we archive? How do we archive? And how does public memory get converted into f information and knowledge for the people? These are very, very vital questions. When I was working with the government at the Management Mission, funding was not a problem. Funding, because, because there was a natural funding stream there that supports these things. But then I had this, uh, this problem of access and issue. Things may have changed now with the government. I'm talking about 10 years past. But having started an NGO, and then again, the problem, the, of course, it's total freedom, total collaboration, sharing, all that. But then there is no awareness, there's not enough awareness with the public that these things need to be sustained on a regular basis. Even great funding agencies, corporates, big companies, or whoever one goes to for funding, they, the arts and culture at the, are at the very, very bottom of the ladder. They don't think that it matters at all. And then there is no public awareness in that sense of what to how to do, what to do. So this is a question that I'd like to throw open also okay. to the to the panel, who are to the, the people who understand about these things. Because I've had now personal experience of trying to find out as much as possible. Suda, sorry, to, so sorry to interrupt you. No, it's fine. But you know, we have barely sort of. So anyway, uh, I, I put the question okay. forward. So, uh, great. Eight, eight minutes. And all I say is request is to keep your question and answers as brief as possible so that we can have as many people as possible asking questions. Yeah. 
Muji. Yeah. Just a short question, which doesn't have to be sweet. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'd like to go back to the question that uh, Dipes, that you raised in the introduction, which is that why is it that the historians who have not recognized all these people have been celebrated by Dalits, the Badrinarans, uh, these things like that. I think the question that we should we ask is that who these historians are? Uh, has it anything to do with their ethnic background or the caste background, for instance, <coughs> or the entire Brahminical knowledge system, which says that something, some to be celebrated, some are to be erased? I think, uh, so do, do you have a clue from that point of view? Thank you. I suggest we collect a few questions and then we respond to them. Yeah, thank you. And there's a gentleman here. Would you mind introducing us, please? Yeah, um, yeah I'm Nafiz May. I'm completely different area, a, a International Rights Research Institute, but nonetheless, very interesting conversation. There's a point that you raised about uh, authenticity and contestation, which I think quite think we got there. <clears throat> Should there be somebody uh, who's a custodian or institution that's a custodian for authenticity? Um, that's a great question. Yeah, so, so we've used we're collecting questions. Pankaj, please. Pankaj Chandra from Ahmedabad yeah, University. Um, just in the spirit of the first session, which talked <coughs> really about research, translation, and action. And I'm just curious um, um, to hear um, what is the process and way of thinking in which much of this research and much of this observation and deep analysis, deep thinking, becomes part of public understanding mm -hmm. in a way which others understand. And then the pull starts to happen. So I'm curious to hear so about that. May I suggest that we take these three questions, which is a great question, and have the panel respond to them. I personally have something to say to that question. If there's time, I'll say it in public. Otherwise, we'll have a conversation with you. OK. Uh, so we have these three questions, any of you? Could I respond to the question on authenticity that yeah. was raised? Uh, I think it is very important that those of us who are disciplinary, who belong to a profession of historians, uh, where we are the guardians of facts and history, and how far does that pause of adjudication of what is right and what, and I'm here particularly would respond to the, the place of archaeological evidence and historical facts in determining who the site of Ayodhya belongs to. Archaeological evidence was being used across both camps. And therefore, the question of use and abuse of history, of archaeology, so that what was being threatened was not just the mosque and the site, but the disciplines itself. So this idea of the adjudication and the role, the almost responsibility of the disciplines and professions to take positions in spheres of public contestation is always there. But I also like to pitch that with a very different sense of ownership and access, where authenticity is important, is this fear of public festival production where all pasts become accessible to publics through artists who wish to replicate monuments and sites from all over the world with a degree of fidelity, with internet now available to give you images of the ancient Incas and African villages, the Paris Opera House, the Mukteshwar Temple, everything can be replic replicated. And there is no adjudicating power determining, yes, you could have a better reproduction than a lesser one, but it is an open field of consumption. And I think it speaks to the way in which a lot of pasts are being accessible through social media, which lacks those spaces of adjudication and rules keeping. And I think this is both a problem and a huge area. So what happens when knowledge is democratized, when everything can be downloaded by Wikipedia? What role then is of the specialist? How do we protect these domains? So I would just respond by saying, having worked across very different fields, I'm also really concerned about what is this new cultural world of theme park touring and spectatorship and consumption doing? How do we retain notions of pedigree, authenticity, and historicity, and yet open up things to democratic consumption? 
Can I add to that just sure, very briefly? Yeah, yeah. Since you brought up Wikipedia, yeah. I think here it's very instructive to look at the difference in, in the models at work between Wikipedia and Sahapedia because uh, Sahapedia does not have a model in which anyone who wants to can contribute something and maybe it will stay there and maybe it won't. Instead, maybe you should describe the process, but it does, and there's obviously a lot of work to figure out how this should be done in, in, uh, on the internet, but you have a different model. Can yeah. I, sorry, can I quickly call on David? Yes, please. At this point, because David hasn't. Okay. No, no, I. I okay, then, then I'll. I'm happy to listen. Then I'll, okay. Yeah, so that Wikipedia, I think, is a more, more. Two minutes left. Two minutes. Yeah. One minute. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> so I think Wikipedia is a kind of marketplace which welcomes every everybody, every view, every, every suggestion, and has no what you say, authenticity of the person who has, because on the other hand, Sahapedia has, we address people by their, I mean, their disciplinary fields, for example, somebody is a good archaeologist or somebody is a good art historian, we ask that person to contribute, so that's one way of doing it, in making it quote, authentic. I'm coming in very quickly on your question, just, so with, I often have this sentence in my head which I sometimes use to explain to people what I do. So in the classroom, I have two functions. One is that the, the citizen teacher side of me has the job of, ex of making really complex things simple and graspable for my students. But I also have the job of making simple looking things as complex as possible in order to challenge them and challenge myself. And the question mm -hmm. is how do you bring those two aspects of your thought mm -hmm. to the public? Certain ideas go over quickly, and certain ideas are deep and complex and take time, but in between there are things to be done. For instance, something we don't do here, they do in Australia, they archaeology, they sort of architecturally sometimes stage two conflicting opinions on the same historical event, mm -hmm. an Aboriginal reflecting an Aboriginal point of view and a white point of view at the same time. We don't do this here. Here often what we do is, this is my point of view and I want to abolish your point of view. And that doesn't help to develop an interesting public sphere which can accommodate, which can accommodate actual conflicts. Thank you. So on that note, <laughs> we have come to the end of our time, not to the end of our discussion. Uh, thank you all very much.